Hello, everybody, and you are very welcome to Successful Perspectives. Successful Perspectives, of course, is when we deep dive into a topic of critical importance to our very selective network, Boardroom by Amir. For this episode, I am delighted to be joined by George Oliver, who is the global chairman and CEO of Johnson Controls. Johnson Controls, of course, is a company leading the way in the journey towards sustainability. George, it's wonderful to have you here on Successful Perspectives. It's wonderful to have you in Dubai, and you're very welcome. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's been a while since I've been to Dubai, and it's just fascinating uh, the amount of growth that's occurred in the region. You know, we've been spending the uh, the last week throughout the region in the in the Middle East, and very excited about you know the progress that's being made here and the role that Johnson Controls plays in in how buildings and infrastructure is built and and more important, how it's it's actually maintained to be able to be more sustainable yeah. and ultimately contribute to the to the uh, impact on, on that we need to make on climate change. And of course, sustainability is the hot button topic for all of us. We have COP has moved to the Middle East. It's taken place in Egypt. It's going to take place in the UAE. I know Johnson Controls is a company here that's almost here five decades, a half a century. You've got 5,000 employees across 12 different offices here in the Middle East. You're a company and you're a CEO that knows a lot about sustainability. So I'm going to put you to the test and tell me what have you done inside your organization since you've become global CEO in terms of moving Johnson Controls towards a more sustainable journey? And what lessons would you share with our audience. Yeah, Johnson Controls has a, a long uh, legacy of, of being able to drive sustainability. Uh, for instance, since 2002, we, we have reduced our energy intensity. For that is because we're an HVAC uh, provider. And so we engineer heating, ventilation, air conditioning equipment. Over time, there's been increasing standards you know, for efficiency, for lower GWP refrigerants. And so it has been part of our culture. When we did the merger of Johns Controls and, and Tyco back in 2016, it was with a vision that we would bring together all of the building systems and then being able to connect all of those building systems. And, and, be, and by doing so, you can actually change the, the outcomes of the building. So even though HVAC was, was our legacy, we now have the opportunity to create what I would call autonomous buildings that ultimately are positioned to be able to reduce energy. It can be 30, 40, 50 percent. And so when I took over uh, John's Controls in 2017, that's what we set our vision to be, that we could be the leader in building solutions, we could leverage all of our systems technology, we could deploy a digital platform that allows us to be able to extract data from all of the building systems, and then be able to ultimately change how buildings operate, how they're constructed and how they operate. Buildings represent about 40% of the global carbon footprint, and so the commitments that have been made by governments and by companies and, and the like, to, to be able to achieve net zero, you have to decarbonize buildings. And because of the opportunity that we see in front of us, buildings historically have been very inefficient. They've been built with systems separate and apart. Uh, with, with what we're doing within Johns Controls, we bring all of that together, utilizing a digital platform, use, uh, utilizing data, applying AI, and then ultimately changing the outcomes that we can produce. So we're we're excited about you know, where we are. I think the pandemic um, in the last couple of years has only accelerated uh, our journey um, because number one, it brought health and safety into focus because of the pandemic, but at the same time, um, accelerated the commitments to get to net zero. And so we do both. You know, we ultimately can be positioned for our customers to elevate their indoor environmental quality at the same time that we're reducing energy. It can be 30, 40, 50%. So that's been our vision. Um, it's been lots of learning. It's been a transformation of an incredible a company of assets that now has repositioned to be able to now solve one of the, you know, one of the world's biggest problems. And you mentioned one of the world's biggest problems. Of course, we've had COP in Egypt. We have COP coming to the UAE. What have been some of your takeaways from the previous COP in, in Egypt? And how significant is the, the narrative shift towards adaptation, et cetera? Yeah, so I would say, you know, my my knowledge of COP historically has been where governments come together and 
and obviously given the challenge of ma maintaining climate change to less than a, a one and a half degrees Celsius, you know, they were making commitments uh, to ultimately be able to achieve that goal. But it wasn't until the last, I think the last uh, COP in Glasgow, where the business community now has become more active. And it, it's clear now with the commitments that are being made to net zero, that the, the businesses actually provide the innovation. They provide the technology. They provide the resources. They ha have the capital to deploy. And so what's critical in this journey is not only the business commitment, but that combined with, with the public sector and ultimately getting the right policies, getting or getting the right partnerships, the right policies, and then establishing standards that we all can be held accountable to. And so I think for, for me, it's been more of the evolution of if where it was initially government, you know, or the public sector driving it versus now there's been a huge, you know, surge, surge of businesses stepping up in their, you know, in their segment. So whether it's a high carbon, you know, industry to some of the lower carbon industries, but recognizing that for all of us to be successful, we have to look at our entire supply chain, you know, right from raw materials, right through the services that we provide to our customers. And so I think what excites me, especially with the, with the role that we play within buildings, we're one of the leaders in buildings globally. So what we can do is we can bring our knowledge of, of what can be done and then elevate, you know, the education of all of our constituents, you know, not all, only all of the governments that we, we work within their countries, working with their customers in being able to achieve the, the ultimate goal that we're setting out uh, to, to achieve. And so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that although we're not, we're not accelerating at the speed that, that needs to be, to me, needs to be achieved to be able to maintain the, the, the degree and a half, uh, you know, climate change, but I am encouraged that in the last year, you know, with the commitments that are being made that, you know, we're making, you know, incredible progress. Um, I think what we need to do is we need to make sure we get everyone on board, not only in the business community, but getting the alignment with the public sector that together, when you set those, those, those goals, I believe they're achievable, but it does require a significant amount of change. And you mentioned there we're beginning to see this critical mass in terms of the private sector. And you mentioned there that we're not going to be able to do it alone, right? So what I think of there is how do we drive this through the supply chain and how important are partnerships in all of this? Because as you say, it, it won't be achieved in isolation. So in my experience and, and through my role, you asked me a little bit about you know, my role in, in uh, John's Controls. I, because of the trends that were underway, because of our vision, what we knew we could do, uh, we've taken a, a leadership role in, in many of these forums. And so it starts with being a leader in the business community. So in the US, we're part of the Business Roundtable, which is a group of the top 250 CEOs in the, in the US. And, and last year, we accelerated um, you know, bringing that group together, understanding what our role is, and, and recognize that you have CEOs across all industries. And so it's always an interesting dialogue from the high carbon industries to something that's lower carbon. But it was fascinating, the alignment you know, the commitment to maintaining the planet's health, recognizing that we, we have a job to do. And so what we did was we, we got involved with all of the other business communities around the world. So the European, you know, round table, the Australian Business Council, the Mexican Business Council, the Canadian Business Council, um, and worked across these business groups. And what was fascinating to me in Glasgow was the, 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 the commonality of, of the not only the commitment, but the ability to, to actually make a difference. So we, in Glasgow, we, in, in the, in the uh, private sector, we actually took a role and, and set the stage for what governments need to do to step up and be aligned to what the business community is, is I think, uh, capable of doing. And, and that means the innovation, the technology deployment, getting to you know, a common framework with maybe a price on carbon, so that from an economic standpoint, we're, we're all working off of the same, you know, with the same fundamentals that allow us to be able to deploy capital more, you know, more aggressively to be able to achieve what we believe is achievable. And so I'm encouraged with that. I've been involved with, um, you know, prior it was his, his, his Royal Highness, now His Majesty uh, King Charles, and he launched a group around sustainable markets initiative. 
And so we got active within that because that's a global you know, set of C CEOs, 150, 175 CEOs, again, across all industries, and with the idea that we can make a difference, that we can come together and, and be a catalyst for the change that's re required. And so we took on, I took on, so in the business roundtable, I have the Energy and Environment Committee, which has given me a big, you know, a big platform to be able to make the case for what can be done. And then in the Sustainable Markets Initiative, I've been leading the Buildings Task Force. And this is where you get global CEOs when you talk about the whole supply chain, right from materials, right through construction to, to overall operations of the building, and then over the life cycle, how do you achieve net zero of the life cycle? And so for me, for me and for all of us, it, was, it, it converged on technology as being an important element of what we do um, and the innovation that the, the, the private sector has or has the, has the resources to reinvest. And then in that technology is around, when I think about buildings, it's, it's, a, it's electrification. So like for instance, a core of product within our portfolio is heat pumps or HVAC, but now trending towards heat pumps. Well, with the electrification of the building and, and removing the fossil fuels, you can, we have heat pumps today that can be, be deployed for, that takes one unit of energy and can get, get the output of four to five. So significant efficiency gained at the equipment level. So that's one big element. So everything within the building being you know, electrified. And then the second is digitalization. And I think this is true for most industries where technology, the ability to connect the ability to be able to co co collect data, the ability to understand what is it that we need to do to get to a net zero environment. What happens is it changes the business models in, in, in ultimately how buildings or infrastructure or in any one of these industries are served. And so I think that's a big factor and, and for us within the, the companies within buildings, we've lagged because buildings are viewed as less strategic to their core business. So when you look at, you know, we serve about every, every industry. And so when you look at their building stock, it typically is on, from a prioritization standpoint, lower on their priority list. They want to invest in their core. And so what has happened, where it's been viewed more as a cost or a balance sheet item, now it's being viewed much more strategically. And so what does that mean? It means that now the resource deployment within that company is going to be different because now it's been elevated because buildings need to be healthier and safer because of what we learned through the pandemic. And, and, and then they also need to be more sustainable. They need to have a path because it's such a significant part of their overall carbon footprint, they need a plan to get to net zero. And so what we do um, working with our customers at that strategic level, when you talk to the CEOs or the CFO or the chief sustainability office, officer, you lay out a roadmap that says not only we, we go in, and the and another key point is that to get to net zero, the existing building stock today is going to be in operation, about 70% is going to be in operation by 2050. So the ability to get to net zero requires you to take a, a serious look at the existing buildings and how do you upgrade those with technology, with digitalization that allows you to be able to achieve net zero. And so what we've done as a company, because historically this has been somewhat core to what we do, we now have pr provided you know, solutions. We've, gone, we've built a sustainable you know, solutions business that looks at this holistically. So we can go into a customer, we can survey a building, we can assess what the current you know, state of technology is, we can upgrade systems, and then more important, we can deploy our open blue digital platform that allows us to bridge and connect to everything in the building and then de decide what is now possible uh, through how we operate that building. And so as a result of that, this past year, we doubled our business, you know, the what we call it sustainable infrastructure performance business, where we, we commit and deliver on outcomes. So it would be we go in and survey and say we can reduce energy consume, we can elevate the indoor environment, we can reduce energy 30, 40, 50%. And then what we do is we finance the upgrades of the building and then ultimately deploy a solution that we might be accountable for for the next 15 or 20 years to ultimately get the payback. And so those are the, those are examples of not only the, from a technology standpoint, but from a business model innovation in what is gonna be required um, to ultimately then be aligned to 
to our customers' goals and being able to achieve their, their commitment. And obviously, as you say, this is a critical part on the journey to net zero. And what you described there in terms of the, the technological integration to some of these buildings, it, it sounds, as I say, very important in terms of us being able to achieve this. Could you give me some examples of, of buildings um, that kind of fit that bill where you've done work? Because I think this is important for our audience to understand who's getting this right. Yeah, so when you look at John's Controls, you know, we're, we're a 135-year-old company. We, you know, we, we started with the invention of the thermostat. So I innovation has been our game. And we, over time, have been, have been deploying our products and technology across most of the iconic building landscape globally, uh, pretty much. And so when you look at some of the projects, some of the recent projects in the region, the Dubai Electrical and Water, Water Authority, that's a building that we worked in, and what's critical on new buildings is to be up front, be, be at the table when the development is, is ultimately being proposed because that's where, from an innovation standpoint, there's a lot of innovation deployed right up front in and, and how you think about building systems differently. How do you make sure they're gonna be connected? How do you have a robust data platform to fundamentally change not only how the building operates, but how it ultimately achieves net zero? And so that's a, an example where we did that. And, and by deploying our, not only our systems technology within our products, but also then the, the digital platform, that we've been able to create a net positive building with significant water conservation. So that's an example where we not only re, you know, designed a building for the, the least amount of energy consumed to be able to maintain the square footage of the building, but also brought in renewable supply for the remaining, you know, the remaining demand of, of energy. So driving towards you know, the, 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 the cleaner technology for the remaining demand. There'll always be a demand for some level of, of energy within buildings. And what our commitment is to not only reduce the demand to entitlement and then be able to be innovative in how we bring forward renewable supply, you know, that, that, that makes sense for the building or the region that they operate within. So that's a great example of, of where we, we didn't only achieve net zero, we actually are net positive, given providing energy back, back to the grid, being able to be used elsewhere. And obviously we're in amazing Dubai in the, in the UAE, and you talk about a, a future forward type of a place. You know, we even have the museum of the future. What, what's your take on the direction of travel for sustainability here? Oh, I think there's an incredible um, demand or opportunity here where I think there, there, there is forward thinking, you know, there is um, opportunity here and, and, and there has been already a lot of that um, innovation being applied. We, we were a partner um, in, in the, the Museum of, of Future Technology. Um, we're extremely proud to have been a partner there because I think we can then demonstrate not only do we create a building of the future, um, at the same time that the activity within the building now is really focused on technologies and innovation that can go well beyond buildings relative to how you, for the region, ultimately achieve net zero. So that is a, a great example of when you bring, when you have a vision, when you start you know, right from scratch and bring in the right partners um, and how you can achieve so much more than what historically has been achieved through the, you know, the traditional building construction process and, and ultimately how buildings are, are operated over the life cycle. And when you talk about this, George, I can see you're very passionate about it. And I run a network for CEOs and I always think CEOs have a bias towards optimism. And I can see with Net Zero, you're, you're cautiously optimistic. If we bring the right stakeholders together, we can get there, but a lot of work needs to get done. But, but what are some of the challenges realistically that we need to overcome? Well, I think the, the, the biggest challenge is that there's a view, there's a view across CEOs and, and, and across many of the constituents um, that are critical to achieving net zero that this is going to be all cost, meaning it's going to be high cost and who's going who's to ultimately bear the burden of the cost that it's going to take to decarbonize. And I think for the CEOs, for CEOs that, that, are, that are, you know, as they're learning and, 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 and mapping their plans to get to net zero, assume that there's technology today and innovation today that, that, that can be deployed, that can minimize. It doesn't mean it can be 
you know, zero, but it can absolutely minimize the cost. And then you'd be surprised at the outcomes that can be achieved um, when you when you work on that in, in a very innovative um, with partners you know, approach to it. And so I think for us, it's in, within buildings, it's been that because I think it's viewed as, well, it's going to be significant cost and who's going to pay and how do I how do I ultimately pay back? And what we've done, we've demonstrated to customers that you can we can we can defer their CapEx, we can do what we do as a service. So instead of having a big CapEx uh, challenge to be able to deploy the, the new technologies, we can go in and, and then decide what is it, what can we do to, to make the building more efficient, deploy new equipment, new technology, deploy Open Blue, And we have in many cases shown we can get a payback, meaning that, that we can finance it, we can then with the savings that we're achieving with the building being much more efficient, um, it, it can be much more sustainable. So you're achieving both. You're getting a payback for the upgrade at the same time that you're minimizing the cost of, of how you actually you know, transition to a cleaner, cleaner energy. So I think that's a myth. And, and I think it, at, at the end of the day, my message to, to CEOs is, is um, you know, it's, it's it's embrace, you know, instead of resist, embrace, and then learn, and, and, and open up, the success is achieved through an ecosystem of partners. And so I think in the past, we look at things somewhat narrow within our industry, and what I've learned in these, these um, groups, whether it be, you know, the BRT or the Sustainable Markets Initiative or different, where when you, when you start to open up and see what is actually happening end to end, you know, through across multiple industries end to end, that a lot of that uh, can be leveraged and applied to what what is done, you know, locally within within your business. George, you've been very gracious with your time. One one last question. You're a global CEO. Johnson Controls is an important company in accelerating this journey to sustainability. You're you're a very credible thought leader in the space of the, the built environment. So look into the future, not even that far away, let's say 10 years. Help me understand what the built environment looks like in, in 10 years. My vision, and I, and I think it's only been accelerating the last uh, two years, is that where buildings have, been, have lagged other industries relative to digitalization and in the deployment of technology, I think what you're gonna see because they're, they're so significant, uh, because you don't get to net zero without decarbonizing buildings, that because of that, that there's going to be a huge acceleration of innovation, deployment of, of digitalization across infrastructure, use of data, upgrading of systems that is going gonna, is gonna to get to an autonomous building. That the built environment, um, similar to other industries that, that you know, for decades have been kind of digitalizing end to end, uh, which drives significant efficiency with the use of data and, and the deployment of AI so you can actually deploy intelligence to, to take what you might have thought was, was efficient in the past. And we're learning that once you get to the critical data and you apply AI through our open blue platform, that we can achieve outcomes that are far beyond whatever you know, we've achieved in the past. So I think the vision is you'll see in the next 10 years a significant acceleration to what I would call autonomous buildings that are fully digitalized using data and not only for the building operations, but what we say, we bring the operating technology combined with our customer's infrastructure from an IT standpoint, and that operating technology not only achieves a net, net zero building, but that same technology enhances how the building is actually utilized. And so whether it be you want to understand occupancy, how the space is being used, you know, di different levels of, of um, health and safety within the building and how that, how that converts to productivity, there's so much more that can be done, you know, with the, the data that we collect that ultimately drives net zero that can be a significant strategic asset in how you actually run, run your company. And so for, for us, that's what excites me. I think with the, the value proposition that we have, with the, what we believe is possible, that, that fundamentally is going to drive a lot of change. It sounds like an exciting future. George Oliver, Chairman and CEO of Johnson Controls, thank you so much for being on Successful Perspective. Yeah. Thank you, Trevor. I've enjoyed the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you.